Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. This is going to uh, not be related exactly to what we're talking about today. But Tracy, have you watched the documentary series Light and Magic? No. Okay. Well, it's amazing. Um, if you are a film dork and you <laughs> you love particularly VFX, uh, it is about the beginnings of industrial light and magic and how all of those people really did in their very, very disorganized and wonderful creative ways, um, change the film industry. But that is not at all what we're talking about today. We bring this up because in one of his interviews, Richard Edlund, who is one of the great uh, forerunners of visual effects, at least in the modern era, mentioned uh, himself as a kid running around with a camera and he, I don't remember the exact quote, but he says, you know, like, looking like I was Ouija. And I was like, oh, I forgot I had Ouija on my list. <laughs> uh, Ouija, if that name is not familiar to you, is a fairly famous photographer. Um, he is often cited as having been a really strong influence on the work of artists like Dean Arbus and Andy Warhol. Uh, but on the on a bigger scale, because he's pretty unique in that a lot of people saw his work without knowing who he was, and he was also getting attention from the art world. Uh, He influenced the entire world, really, in how New York City was viewed by people, both people who lived in the city and people outside of it, because he really showed the city through his lens in a way that was very unvarnished and raw, in stark black and white. So that is who we are talking about today. So he's known as Ouija today. He was born Usher Felig in Zolichiv, which at the time was in Austria-Hungary. Now it's in Ukraine. That was on June 12, 1899. And when he was seven, his father, Bernard, left for the United States. So Usher and his mother and his three siblings stayed behind. They were there for the next four years while Bernard was working on all kinds of jobs, just trying to get settled enough that he could send for the rest of the family and have them join him in the U.S., At one point early on, uh, he sent his wife some stage money as a joke. She initially thought it was real. I'm a little just irritated by this whole story. (laughs) Uh, She packed herself up in the children and got ready for a move. And the bank also initially thought this was real and exchanged this currency. They figured it out, though, before the family left for the U.S. and they had to cancel their move. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, this is all based on, of course, Ouija's later recollections, and he's known for kind of embellishment and whatnot. But the way he describes the money, it had some pretty key indicators that it was fake, like a joker on the back and stuff, but... <laughs> like not legal tender in China. Right. And it wasn't like from a game. It was like to be used in a play. It was stage money, but uh, apparently good enough to fool a bank. But (laughs) they did eventually make it. In 1906, when Usher was still 10, the family was finally reunited. At that point, Bernard had started a push cart of his own to make money because he had just struggled so much trying to get other people to give him an opportunity that actually paid a decent living wage. This was a lesson that I think you can see as we talk about Ouija's life story. It clearly imprinted on his son, Usher. And in later years, Ouija wrote about coming to the United States and said that Ellis Island seemed, quote, the most beautiful place in the world. Even as immigration officials inspected him and his family to make sure they weren't bringing disease into the country. Uh, But what really struck this 10-year-old boy was being given fresh fruit while he was there. He had never, he said, seen a banana or an orange before. And his name also changed at this point, at least on paper, to Arthur. He does not appear to have ever gone by that name and his family certainly didn't use it, but in the United States and in biographies, you'll often see him listed as uh, Arthur Felig. The family moved soon after that from Bernard's Lower East Side tenement apartment on Pitt Street to another at the corner of Cherry and Jackson. That was right next to a public school. And his father had negotiated for the family to live there for free because he and his wife were going to do all the building's janitorial work. 
They still struggled financially, and they were still trying to learn English. They were often called out as foreigners, but Ouija described his family as having a pretty happy time during this point in his life. Yeah, he's he. whether or not he is um, glossing over it or making it sound better than it was, because he talks about going hungry sometimes. He still talks about, like, nah, it was pretty carefree, though, for me, and I really liked my childhood. As he was learning English... Usher, at the time, became engrossed in the stories of Horatio Alger, who famously popularized the rags-to-riches story in popular novels. The young Felig was convinced that he, too, could amass wealth if he just worked hard enough, just like the boys in the books. So he started his own paper route. Just pretty enterprising. But the problem was he could only get English language papers, and most of his neighbors were immigrants, too. They could not read English well enough to want to buy a daily paper. So that didn't pan out. (laughs) Usher moved on to reading detective novels and transitioned his personal business to selling candy. He started out by purchasing the candy on credit. He somehow talked to a store manager into allowing him to do this. And then he took the candy cart around to the sweatshops in the neighborhood after school. He would sell things like chocolate and chewing gum to the women who were working in these sweatshops during their breaks. He reported making a 100% profit from this enterprise, and he gave all of his earnings to his parents to just keep the family fed and clothed. When Usher was 14, he quit school. He was a smart kid, and he did pretty well, but he found it very boring compared to the rest of his life. He also was known to sleep in, and he would kind of sleep until he heard the bell. And then since he lived right next door to the school, he would just kind of run over looking completely disheveled and start his day. (laughs) Although his principal really tried to get him to finish school because he was pretty smart. The family really needed more money than he was pulling in with his after-school candy cart, and he had already become fascinated with photography. Before he had left school, a street photographer had taken his picture with a tintype camera. Those were the cameras that captured images on sheets of metal that had a dark lacquer coating. This whole experience had really captivated him. He saved up enough money to order his own inexpensive tintype camera. So he did manage to get an 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. job with a photography studio after a few months of working with this tintype. He definitely saw this as a way to continue his education and learn from actual photographers. That studio specialized in taking photographs of large objects that door-to-door salesmen would then use to make their pitches to potential buyers. It, of course, was not realistic to carry things like furniture, chandeliers, and headstones around to make sales. And Usher worked as an assistant, positioning the products and the lights as directed, and just trying to make everything look as good as possible for these photos. He also ran errands, he swept up after shoots, he did basically all of the jobs that the lowest man on the ladder would be assigned. The other area of specialty for this photography business was taking photos of burned-out buildings for insurance filings. Usher was in charge at these shoots of blowing flash powder. He described blowing the powder through a tube onto alcohol-soaked rags to ignite that powder and light up the photograph. This probably informed his later work doing a lot of night photography. But for all of this work, some of it pretty dangerous, the flash powder not always very safe to be around, he made four fifty dollars a week. So two years into his job, the camera operator left, and Usher was promoted into that vacant position. When his boss refused to pay him even half of what the previous camera operator had made, Usher quit on the spot. This might sound rash for somebody who was helping to support his family, but Usher had a whole other income stream because he was still selling candy on the side, although his later work hours had led to him transitioning to selling this candy at burlesque clubs instead of at factories. And at this point, Usher was 18. So he bought himself a view camera, and he started his first career as a freelancer. And he was really, really pretty smart. You'll see... It, throughout his story, he's pretty savvy about business. Uh, he f- he kind of made his own customer base. So he would take photographs of children on the weekends, riding a pony that he rented. Basically, he would just get neighborhood kids and put them on this pony and take their picture. And then once he had developed the proofs, he would visit those kids' parents, show them those proofs, and then be like, don't you want to order some prints? <laughs> 
He later wrote that he believed that there was not a single East Side home that didn't have one of his photos of a child on a pony sitting in it. But once boarding the pony outpaced his income, he had to give that enterprise up. This was the time of restlessness for Usher. He wanted to move out on his own, although this was painful for his family. They were really close-knit. It was upsetting to his mother in particular. She caught him trying to leave with a suitcase and was so upset about it that he stayed. A few weeks later, he sneaked away when the rest of the family was asleep. This was a bold and kind of foolhardy move. He didn't have money or a job or a place to stay, so he was sleeping in parks and missions, but eventually started spending the night at Pennsylvania Station. He had a whole routine where every night he would check the payphones for loose change, and then he would find a bench in the waiting room to sleep on until police came to move people out in the morning. Ouija wrote in his autobiography that he would tip the officers a dime to let him sleep a little longer. He was finally able to find some work as a busboy in an automat restaurant. This was part-time work. It was 10.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m., basically to cover the lunch hours. But it also included a light breakfast beforehand and then all the leftover unpurchased items when lunch was over, as well as being paid a dollar a day. This is a pretty good deal at the time. He spent 25 cents a night to rent a room, and he spent the extra available time looking for more photography jobs. He claimed that he eventually got himself fired from the automat job on purpose because he felt like as long as he stayed there, he was doing well enough that he was not working as hard as he should to get a photography job. We don't really know if he got fired on purpose or if he got fired because he did something actually wrong, but he definitely lost the job. Uh, And after that, he took some day labor jobs, mostly in factories, until he found a job taking passport photos. He was really good at this passport job because he managed to sell people who only needed two photos for their travel documents entire packages of portraits for $25 each. Having had multiple passport photos, I'm also impressed that they were photos anyone would want to have of themselves. Right? I don't want more of those. (laughs) His boss increased his salary from $15 a week to $40, and he described this period in his life as living it up. He was a young man making great money, and he partied a lot. But after three years of the job at the passport studio, 24-year-old Usher took a 50% pay cut to start working at Acme News Pictures in 1923. And we will talk about Ouija's time at Acme after we first pause for a sponsor break. mentioned that Ouija started at Acme News Pictures in 1923, and that was the year that Acme had started. It was a subsidiary of Scripps Howard, and this was essentially set up to be an in-house source of imagery for the Scripps Howard News Syndicate, including the New York Herald Tribune. And Usher was hired to work in the darkroom, developing photos and making prints. He made it known that he wanted to be a photographer, but because he was unwilling to agree to the dress code of shirt and tie, he only got sent out on night jobs, kind of in emergency situations. This actually aligned pretty nicely, though, with Usher's desires. He loved taking photos of New York's night happenings, and a lot of his work on those early assignments was taking pictures of fires. He was really glad to be shooting more dynamic moments instead of things like passport photos. And he recognized that working in the darkroom had actually made him think about how his photos would develop. So he had a stronger eye for catching moments than if he had not been doing that job. He was working in the news photo business in a really unique time. He was seeing all of the events of the time as they developed under his hands. But he also saw the transition from flash powder to flash bulbs, and he saw the shifting role of news photographer as subjects like presidents became important to capture. Keep in mind, it was only in the late 19-teens that newspapers started running photographs with stories instead of illustrations. So it was really the start of the field of photojournalism. Ouija would later write that he and photography were growing up at the same time. He also saw during this work that speed was vital. Whichever outlets got their negatives to the telephone company's distribution offices first ensured that their credit was the one that the entire country would see. So while at Acme, 
Usher came up with some fairly ingenious and slightly sneaky ways to get ahead of the competition. For example, he would rent an ambulance to go out on a job, then have it parked and waiting while the shots were being taken. And then when he finished photographing and he jumped back in the vehicle, the sirens were turned on and they could zip downtown while Usher developed the photos in the back of the ambulance. He knew if he got caught doing this, he was going to get in trouble. So he would change it up sometimes with things like taxis and trains and always doing this mobile developing, which is pretty impressive. On one shoot, he said that he locked himself in an empty subway train's motorman's booth and developed the glass plate negative in there before he got to his stop. Also, unbeknownst to his bosses, Usher moved into the dark room at Acme. He kept the makings of a bed in his locker He would pull them out at night after everybody left. He cooked out of cans on the engraver's stove, and he loved that he did not have any neighbors. After a lifetime of living in cramped rental spaces, he was actually pretty happy with this whole arrangement. He outed himself to his bosses when the United Press ticker machine went off at 4 a.m. on September 3rd, 1925. That was alerting news outlets to the crash of the Navy dirigible, the USS Shenandoah, that crashed in Ohio. He decided the story was more important than his secret about living there in the dark room, so he called his bosses. So this ended his sleeping arrangements, but Acme got photos from the crash site before anybody else, since all of the other news photographers got the message when they arrived at work in the morning, hours after Usher and his bosses had already ensured that a cameraman in Ohio could get the shot and then send it via train porter to New York. The other offshoot of having his squatting in the office suddenly out in the open was that his bosses actually realized he was pretty happy to take photography jobs at all hours. He was clearly a night owl. So when news broke outside of the usual 9 to 5 workday, it just started to be Usher that they called instead of one of the regular staff photographers. He had an ear-to-the-ground approach to getting shots of crime scenes, and he moved really fast to get to the sites and take the pictures. And that's been said as uh, something that led to that widely known moniker of Ouija. It's a phonetic version of the commonly mispronounced word Ouija, and cops started calling Usher that because it seemed like he was psychic. He would show up at crime scenes even before the police got there on occasion. But according to Ouija himself, it was actually given to him by young women around the office. Either way, this name stuck, and he liked it, and he started using it. And after 12 years at Acme, Ouija was starting to feel restless and like his day-to-day had actually grown kind of stale. He was ready to do more photography of the things he chose rather than waiting and hoping for assignments while he was developing the work of other photographers. So in 1935, he gave two weeks notice and once again returned to his freelance instincts. Because of his years with Acme, Ouija knew the police around Manhattan. So as a freelancer, he started hanging out at police headquarters. They didn't have press credentials, but cops had seen so much of him that they assumed that he did. He would actually pull the teletype slips off of the machines and then hand them over to police reporters. And so when they'd catch a story, he would just finagle a ride along with them. He later wrote of this time, quote, crime was my oyster and I liked it. My postgraduate course in life and photography. He also somehow during this time had finagled getting the key to the dark room at the New York Post. So he would develop his prints there and then he would give that outlet first dibs on the shots that he had. And then he would make the rounds at other papers to sell his photos. He also wrote about this time why he felt his work was taking off and why those often grisly images of people who had been shot or were in car accidents or were trying to escape tenement fires were so appealing to readers. He wrote, quote, It was during the Depression, and people could forget their own troubles by reading about others. And Ouija was smart about hustling. In instances where there were photos with two people, like a cop and the man he had just arrested, Ouija would cut the photo in half and sell each half as a separate image that would double his income. He also knew some papers wanted not just crime photos, but also things like cute animal shots, so he cut deals with all the local fire stations to call him if any of their dogs ever had any litters. He would stage cute pictures of the mother and babies. He was basically always working as many angles as he could to sell as many photos as he could. 
And surprisingly, he sold a lot of them to tabloids, whose readers Ouija described as needing, quote, their daily bloodbath and sex potion to go with their breakfast. And though he had left Acme because he had gotten bored there, he still had a really good relationship with them. He left on good terms. And he specifically had a good relationship with the photo editor there. He later said that he always saved the best photographs for Acme and that he knew he would always make a sale there. He later lamented, though, that he had been so good at providing such a steady stream of crime scene photos, editors got choosy, readers were less and less enthralled. Just as his cachet was dwindling, he managed to get photos of a couple of teenagers, Gladys McKnight and her boyfriend, who had committed a grisly murder. Through his connections and a friend's, he had been the only photographer allowed to meet and take photos of the couple. He sold these to every paper in town. After that, his name on a photo byline had enough clout that photo editors were no longer jaded with his crime scene shots. At some point, he started stamping his photo prints with the imprint by Ouija, the famous. Life magazine even ran a story about Ouija and his work and his close ties to police headquarters. Yeah, those photographs are super duper weird um, (laughs) that he got of those teenagers. Gladys and her boyfriend killed Gladys's mother in a very gruesome way. But the photos that he took of them look like engagement photos. It's really creepy and weird. That's very creepy. It is, but it's why people all wanted to buy them. Uh, And that is how, three years into his post-Acme freelance career, Ouija, who had gotten famous at this point, got permission to install a police radio right in his own car. This meant that he was more or less guaranteed to always be the first photographer on site for any emergency, murder, rescue, fire, or accident. He was able to get shots before crowds had even formed, adding to the intimacy of his lens's point of view. He turned his car, which was a 1938 Chevy Coupe, into a mobile photo studio. He carried camera equipment, protective gear, food, extra clothes, and even disguises in the trunk. In 1940, he started working regularly with the magazine PM Magazine. This was on a salary. That relationship lasted four and a half years, and during that time, he got paid every week whether he brought in images or not. He was also given the freedom to make his own assignments. He worked with the Daily News, the Herald Tribune, the Sun, and, as we mentioned, the Post. The decade of the 1940s was the apex of his career. In addition to those papers, all pretty regularly purchasing photographs, the New York Photo League had also taken notice of Ouija's work. And in 1941, the organization staged an exhibit of that work. Two years later, his photos started to go on exhibit at the Museum of Modern Art. Yeah, that relationship with PM Magazine only ended because the magazine went bankrupt, not because he had any falling out with them. He quite liked them. Not all of Ouija's photographs, we should say, were of crimes and the people involved in them. He also took photos sometimes with very clear social commentary. One of his most famous photographs during this time was called The Critic, and it was taken in 1943. It features two society women in fancy dress with white fur capes, and they have these sort of benign, pleasant expressions. And they're walking by another woman who is dressed much more humbly. That third woman is in profile, She has a slumping posture, and she appears to be sneering at the other two women judgmentally. We're going to talk about this image some more in a minute, but it was widely praised as a social commentary illustrating the values of the working class versus the wealthy. He also took more joyous photos. He took a photo in 1941 called Afternoon Crowd at Coney Island. This has literally thousands of people in it. They're all crowded onto the beach. From his vantage point above them, he yelled and got their attention, and when a lot of people turned to face him, Ouija snapped the picture. He also took pictures in places like movie theaters, using infrared film to capture the goings-on of the crowd, even in the dark. He took a lot of photographs at a place called Sammy's Bowery Follies, which was a club full of performers and clientele that one might describe as being from the fringes of society at the time. They were mixing with celebrities who dropped in for a show or a drink, and he captured the culture and music scene of Harlem in a number of gorgeous photographs. Yeah, those are some of my favorite pictures from him because they're just, they're always super beautiful. Um, There's one really, really great one 
where he took a photo of a family as they were leaving church on Easter Sunday. And when he stopped to talk to them, the man had said, oh, I actually sell clothes. And he was like, well, that's why you look so sharp. And can I take your picture? And it's this great picture. They're all smiling. They all look beautiful. But the great part is there's this kid who is part of the family and he's dressed super sharp, but he's kind of leaning around from behind what I presume is his dad. And he has this great smile on his face. And it's just this like spectacular capture of a moment. Uh, We are going to talk about Ouija's foray into the book world after we first hear from the sponsors who keep Stuff You Missed in History class going. In 1945, Ouija published his first book, titled Naked City. And he actually had a pretty hard time finding a publisher who would take his collection of raw, gritty photos. Most publishers also wanted more kitschy and predictable images of the city, which were the kinds of photos that Ouija simply did not take. He had murders and oddball street characters and buildings on fire, and it was all in black and white. For example, one of the images was a group of kids and a woman, all with a very wide range of expressions on their faces. You would have no idea what they were experiencing if it did not have the title, Their First Murder. The caption that he had written for it read, A woman relative cried, but neighborhood dead-end kids enjoyed the show when a small-time racketeer was shot and killed. And the image that he paired this with was a photograph of the murder victim on the ground. Finally, he wrote, quote, The miracle happened. The book was published. He had his book party not at a swank hotel, but at Sammy's. Naked City was a huge success, and it opened the door for him to work for a time at Vogue, and it also made it a lot easier for him to publish the second book, which was Ouija's People, and that came out in 1946. Yeah, it is... He doesn't seem to have had a bad relationship at Vogue, but that was not a good pairing. It doesn't (laughs) seem like a great fit, really. No, he tells a story in his autobiography about how his editor was like, you have to buy a tuxedo because I keep finding out that you weren't let into events because you didn't look nice enough, and I actually need you to get into events to take pictures. Um, (laughs) He he got like a secondhand tuxedo and, you know, wore it all the time because he couldn't afford another suit, he said. Uh, In 1947, Ouija moved to Hollywood, and he stayed there for five years. During that time, he worked as an advisor on films. He occasionally ended up appearing in bit parts. One of the most enduring legacies of this time there is the work he did creating promotional photographs from the set of Dr. Strangelove. If you are a movie buff and you have seen photographs of the pie fight ending of Dr. Strangelove that has never been seen because Kubrick changed his mind and destroyed the negative, those photos were shot by Ouija. And his pictures are the only proof that that abandoned ending ever existed. In 1952, he returned to New York. He published a book of photographs from his time in California the following year that was called Naked Hollywood, The images in this book examine celebrity and the culture surrounding it, as well as ideas of beauty. One series of photos shows a young woman in a crowd, first smiling and then looking worried, and then in the third and fourth shots, breaking down into tears. It's easy to think the photographer had managed to be there when she got terrible news, but the caption reads, quote, an American tragedy, no autograph. Ouija also started to play with images of beauty in ways that often made them look grotesque or absurd, and he called these elastic photos. On one of them, he manipulated a photograph of film star Virginia May, and he made her look really freakish by printing her in a distorted and mirrored way. He basically, like, cut her off about one-third of the way into her image and then mirrored that, so the middle was cut out, and then he had, like, this strange double image of her. It made her appear to have two faces and no arms. Uh, It's interesting. It's weird. He also took a close-up photo of Marilyn Monroe, and he squashed sections of the image. So she, who everyone agreed was spectacularly beautiful, came to look almost like a monster or a funhouse version of herself. But the absurdity of Hollywood was something that Ouija also played with by using himself as the subject of the pictures. In one image, he took a photo of several shelves full of wax heads of celebrities, and his own head is among them. He definitely always seemed to love being part of a spectacle, and a lot of biographers and historians have written pretty extensively about his exhibitionist side as juxtaposed with his observer-photographer side. 
Back in New York, he continued to experiment with his elastic photography, but it just wasn't all that popular. Some of the photos from this period in his life are quite charming, though. One titled Boy Meets Girl from Mars features a man and a woman in a passionate embrace, but both of them are wearing futuristic clothes and helmets. Throughout the 1950s, it sort of seemed like he was trying to find a new voice in his work. He went to Europe, he came back to the States, he took sexy photos of Betty Page on a New Jersey farm, he played with image manipulation, but he never found a second wave of iconic style like those earlier gritty New York images he had created. He also made a nudist film of himself. Strikes most people as a little odd. Yeah, the strange little plot, his strange little foray. He he dabbled in nudism, and that film is uh it's very it's like a very strange art house film. When Ouija wrote his autobiography in 1961, he dedicated it to the tool that has made his career, writing, quote, to my modern Aladdin's lamp, my camera. And you get a sense of the man immediately from the opening paragraph of the book, which reads, quote, my typewriter is broken. I own no dictionary, and I never claimed I could spell. And if Shakespeare, Balzac, and Dostoevsky could do it the hard way in longhand, so can I. He continues on to say that he doesn't need a ghostwriter and he has no creative inhibitions and that, quote, what may be abnormal to you is normal to me. If I had to live my life over again, I would do it all the same way, only more so. It's a very fun read, although there is a lot of talk about his womanizing and some pretty detailed discussion of the sex workers of New York at the time, which comes along with a significant amount of misogyny. He talks, for example, about Saturday being the day of the week that he went to various addresses that were shared among the men that he knew as being the addresses of sex workers. His talk about this isn't violent or scary, but it's detached and dehumanized. And most historians encourage taking a lot of this autobiography with a grain of salt. He is, as promised, pretty uninhibited in telling his story, He doesn't make himself out as a hero or anything, but he is very confident to the edge of cockiness about his work, and he does tend to center himself in every possible way. He's open about scenes that got to him, for example. He describes getting to scenes where people jump to their deaths and driving right by rather than stopping to take the picture, choosing not to stop because he knew he couldn't handle it, and then going home for the night. He's also open about a scene where he photographed a woman and her adult daughter as they found out that two of her younger children had burned to death and that he cried when he took the photo, writing, quote, the image of two crying women was to haunt me for the rest of my life. I was raised in a tenement and I just couldn't escape them. It didn't bother him to take pictures of murdered gangsters, but family tragedies really upset him. He also mentioned that after being really shaken by photographing so many car crashes of vehicles that had crashed onto the street under the West Side Highway after losing control, he launched his own campaign to photograph the lack of safety at that site and to sell those to newspapers to run as a story about the problem. This got the city to finally add reflective markers to the abutments in the road, and of this effort he wrote, quote, this work I consider my memorial. What he doesn't include in that autobiography is any mention of his wife, Wilma Wilcox, who he had married a number of years before writing it. Whether she was chagrined to have been left out, we do not know. He also, in talking about the many, many women with which he claimed to have been intimate, never mentions an earlier marriage that didn't last very long. He seems, of course, to have been uninhibited talking about himself only in some ways, apparently. Wilma and Ouija had known each other since the 1940s. She was a social worker and a Quaker, and Ouija had come to depend on her after he was diagnosed with diabetes in the late 1950s. Ouija died on December 26, 1968, in New York City, and Wilma was kind of the steward of his photograph collection after that. Part of the unique appeal of Ouija, both when he was working and now, is how much his photos made the viewer feel like they were part of the scene. The way his work is composed often makes you feel like you're standing right in the middle of the action as it's going on. 
During his career, this gave his images appeal for the press. It made every story more real for the readers. And then today, it offers a unique documentary view of the New York that he lived and worked in. But there have always been questions about whether these were all caught in the moment. And there have been instances where he confessed that some of his shots were staged, at least partially. For example, his photo, The Critic, that we talked about earlier, which was so acclaimed as a commentary on class, was actually somewhat contrived. The woman in the photo looking at the two wealthy socialites with disdain was a heavy drinker who was known around the Bowery. And Ouija confessed in a book written several years after the photo was taken that he had had his assistant at the time, Louis Leota, buy her drinks until she was very intoxicated. And then they essentially propped her up on the street outside the Met as limousines were pulling up to drop off opera goers. She is probably not looking at them with any kind of scorn. She's just very, very drunk and trying to fix her eye on something. Even with those kinds of manipulations, Ouija is recognized as an exceptional figure in photographic art. He was famous in both popular publishing and art circles in his lifetime, He figured out a way to exist as an artist on his own terms, in part because he had basically gotten in on the ground floor of photojournalism. And he remains fascinating today. His crime scene photos are still jarring and evocative and intriguing, and his other work continues to be examined and interpreted as photography buffs and biographers try to kind of tease out where the balance was between Usher Felig and Ouija. I highly encourage looking at lots of his work, because it's very interesting. Like I said, some of it is obviously graphic. Yeah, there's so much of it online, and I I don't know if it's the entire collection of his artwork, but if you just Google Ouija, there's a whole website that's collected right there. Tons and tons and tons. Uh, If you have a library card, I almost guarantee your local library has a book with photographs by him. They are everywhere. Um, I am jumping tone so significantly to our listener mail today. (laughs) This is from our listener, Kate, who writes, Hi, ladies. I'm a longtime listener who saves your podcast episodes to binge listen on my many drives from Kansas to Minnesota and back again. This has been a major sanity saver as my dog, Twyla, photos attached, is not the most talkative travel companion. Twyla is cute. Uh, Yesterday, toward the end of my third round trip to Minnesota this summer, I reached the episode on Dr. Lucy Hobbs Taylor. I was delightfully surprised to find that her life's journey took her to the exact place I was traveling to and have called home for four years, Lawrence, Kansas. I drove by her Vermont Street residence, uh, photos also attached, on my way to work this morning. There's a lovely private orchard between her former home and, would you believe it, a dental practice called The Dentists in Lawrence. There are many historical buildings in the city of Lawrence, including a few on the University of Kansas campus, but I didn't know until today that Dr. Hobbs Taylor's house was one of them. Thank you for teaching me something new about my own community, in addition to all the other incredible things your podcast covers. History really is all around us. Um, That seems so fun to me, to like discover that a major prominent person in history who, again, we all need dental work at some point in time, Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, you know, helped shape a field that is so vital to everybody's health and well-being. Uh, So I love it. I love it. Thank you so much, Kate, for writing us this letter. I hope that you had a lot of fun exploring and discovering these places. I had read that there was an orchard near her house, and I have never gotten to see a good picture of it. So so it was exciting. Um, If you would like to write to us, you can do so at historypodcast at iheartradio.com. You can also find us on social media as Missed in History. And if you have not subscribed yet, you can do that quick as a wink on the iHeartRadio app or anywhere you listen to your favorite shows. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.